<laughs> right. They, um, I literally can't believe there's not a single person sitting in the front row. Sure. Uh, but, you know, you can't change human nature. Yeah. Anyone that's coming in now, sit at the front. It's going to get socially awkward otherwise. Right. <laughs> they, um, uh, welcome, everyone. We're going to start because we are late, and that my only job is to start on time, finish on time, so 50% fail. Uh, uh, my name's Torsten Bell. I'm the chief exec of the Resolution Foundation. You are very welcome uh, indeed today to this joint event from the Resolution Foundation and the Greater Manchester Combined Authority. We're very excited uh, to be here. If someone had told me we were going to be in such a nice room with loads of really great art on the wall, then we'd have opened up Resolution Foundation Manchester office and we'd be here every day. Uh, it's very nice and it's really great to see such a large turnout, especially when it's raining uh, and it's quite late. But that is what free booze will do. <laughs> the, um, uh, so thank you all for coming. In terms of uh, the plan for today, now obviously anyone focusing on economic policy making or the economy generally at the moment is rather focused on the short term. That is reasonable when you've got the highest inflation for 14 years and some of the worst economic policy making and longer um, going on right now. So I understand where the short term is taking up a lot of all energy. We're worried about what this winter has to bring for people's living standards. Um, but it is also important that we keep the keep the reasons why the country is finding those circumstances so difficult in the front of our minds, which from our perspective is basically 15 years of low growth plus 40 years of high inequality gives you a country that then struggles when hard things happen to it, and that is where we are uh, today. So I'm sure we will talk, touch a bit on the short-term stuff today, but we're also trying to bring us back to the big picture, which is how does Britain and the UK as a whole succeed in the 2020s, and what's Greater Manchester's part in that? So that's the overall purpose for today's event. To help you do that, you've got a great panel of speakers. So first of all, you're going to hear from Lindsay Judge, who's a research director at the Resolution Foundation. She's going to take you through some of the content from Stagnation Nation. Has anyone got a copy? Hold it up, someone. There we go, that. Get some more downstairs. They're free there, because there's no lunch, but there is free books. The, um, uh, she can take you through some of the highlights of that and also but particularly in so far as it relates to uh, questions about how Greater Manchester fits into the potential for a new economic strategy. Then you're going to hear from uh, Diane Coyle, who doesn't really need much introduction uh, here, but runs uh, the Bennett School in Cambridge and has done loads of great things, but is also, as far, I mean, you keep saying yes to helping Greater Manchester out with things, so I'm not going to list all the things, but all of them basically, for the last 15 years, and, and it's going and to this launch. Is, this is free as well. It also free, and also excellent, uh, which is being launched today, the Greater Manchester Ind Independent Prosperity Review update on the evidence base. Please do read it. I was reading it yesterday, and I learned a lot, and even though some of you might you know, think you know everything about Greater Manchester, I bet you'll learn something useful for it. So have a read of uh, that, and then I'm going to go down the panel. You're going to hear from Bev Craig, leader of... Uh, Manchester Council, the, um, uh, but who also leads up all the economy work for the combined authority. Then you're going to hear from Louis Corwell, who runs the LEP, and is going to tell us about how we're going to have an economic strategy for Manchester that trumps everything else in the world. And then we're going to hear from Henry Overman, who's a professor of economic geography at the London School of Economics. And despite having London in the title, he does love the rest of the country. <laughs> so you mustn't boo. Now, the job for all of you guys is uh, we, haven't, we have quite a short and sharp session today. Um, so go on to Slido while we're doing it and put your questions in as we go. Slido is a website, and if you need Wi-Fi to get on to Slido, the, it's uh, Art Gallery Public. Do you see what they did there? It's free, totally free. Go on, log on to the Wi-Fi, go on to Slido. The hashtag is Greater Manchester. Put your questions in there and vote on, because then we can get going straight on with the questions when you've heard from the speakers. That is the plan, everyone. So, Lindsay, kick us off. <laughs> Thanks so much, Torsten, and, and um, it's lovely to be here. Um, I have the easy gig tonight, which is I have to summarise a 150-page report in about eight minutes, I think, and I'm going to try and do it in about eight slides. So let me start um, with, with the problem statement that Torsten has already set out for us, which is what we're essentially looking at in the Economy 2030 inquiry, which is that we've had high inequality in the UK, and we have since around about the 1980s, and we have low growth, and we've had particularly parlous growth since the global financial crisis compared to our um, competitor countries. And that is a toxic combination if you're interested in living standards. And that's what this first chart is, is showing you very, very clearly. So to just explain what it's doing, it's showing you how the bottom, the red bar, the middle, the median, the blue bar, and the top, which is the kind of greeny colored bar, um, of the income distribution perform in the UK 
relative to the countries that are on the x-axis. So I won't spell them all out for you, but I mean, the, obviously the sort of big standout um, finding here is that in Norway, the bottom 10% of the population in terms of their income distribution have 60 plus percent more income than the bottom 10% in the UK, which is an absolutely kind of staggering um, figure. And you can, read, you, know, you can read off the graph and you can see that that holds true for many of our comparator countries in the OECD. There are a couple that underperform us, but uh, clearly those are not the ones that we would be interested in emulating. So what we've been doing in the Economy 2030 inquiry is thinking really, really hard about like, how do we tackle these long-term um, endemic structural problems. And I'm going to cut to the chase here and tell you um, what a, a huge amount of work has, has basically driven us towards, which is that we could change that but if we want to change that and if we want to develop an economic strategy, we have to play to our comparative advantage as a country. And our comparative advantage, fundamentally, is that we're a service superpower, and this chart proves that point very clearly. If you look at the export of services, um, we just, we, you know, we're, we're just shy. The, the, next, the next one down from the United States of America, um, this is where we, we really shine as a country. And I think it's really important to sort of linger on that because, of course, it's not just a question of where we are now, but where we've been in the past. And if we, if we look back to, say, 1989, we can see that, that the things that we're outputting and that we were good at then, we're generally good at now too. And that suggests that there's a certain stickiness in terms of your kind of economic model that is very hard to buck. So why not sort of play with, go with the flow and, and go with the trend there? And that is a relatively... Well, it's not relatively. It is a good thing for, um, for cities. Because we know that if you look at what a service-oriented economy looks like, it will be spatially complicated and um, concentrated. Um, this is a, a very beautiful chart, but it's somewhat baffling. So I'm going to um, take my time and describe it to you. So what's it showing us? Well, what it's showing us is um, if you, the further you move towards the right-hand side, the more productive a place is becoming. So this is showing us um, gross value added per worker. So it's basically telling us that you know, as you move towards London and Paris, as you can imagine, you're becoming more productive. And the size of the bubble is telling you how many workers there are in those places. So, of course, what we really want to see is, is lots of big places a long way down that axis. We want lots of people to be in highly productive places. Um, you don't need me to describe to you what, what we are in the UK. We're, we're, we're an economy that has a, a superstar city, which is London, um, which is a function of the fact that we're a service-driven economy. Um, but our second cities... Um, generally lag. They're generally quite poor performing against London. Um, and we've highlighted Manchester there, and you can see Manchester sort of sits somewhere in the middle of the pack when it comes to, to um, productivity. Um, it doesn't have to be like that. And I would point you very clearly here to the example of France. France is another, a good comparable economy to the UK, actually, in terms of its industrial mix. It's also quite service-heavy. It also has a superstar city. It has Paris. But its second cities are much more productive than our second cities. And you can see that. You just need to look at Lyon. You need to look at Toulouse. They're, they're outpacing Edinburgh, which is fundamentally our second highest performing city in the UK. So this is, it, it gives us hope, if you like, to think that you know, being a service-driven economy, which will generally mean that we'll see these agglomeration effects in cities, you can be better than where we are today. So how do we get there? Well, I think one of the big lessons from the Economy 2030 inquiry, and, and I'm leaning very heavily on Henry's work here, so apologies, Henry, if I, if I get anything wrong here, is um, closing those productivity gaps takes an awful lot of effort and an awful lot of inputs. So there's a very interesting thought experiment in one of the reports that we did um, over the last year, which is thinking about, well, what would be, what would be necessary to get Manchester... Um, much closer to London to close the gap, the productivity gap between London and Manchester to 20%. It's not currently much larger, as you just saw. So one, the first thought is, well, how much investment would you need? And the answer is here. So currently, Manchester invests, has investment of £109,000 per worker. Um, to, be, to get it up to the productivity of, of closing the gap with London, you'd have to get up to 142,000. So it's about a 30% increase. That's an absolutely extraordinary increase in investment levels that would be required. Another way you can think about it is, of course, you can think about the human capital. Um, Manchester has, has far fewer graduates as a share of its workforce than London does. You'd need to increase Manchester's 
graduate share to 48%. Almost half of the population in Manchester would need to be graduates to decrease that productivity gap between um, Manchester and the capital. And another way, another function, um, another way you can think about it is to think about the number of workers you'd need. And one of the things that's really clear from the Economy 2030 work is that you'd need to grow cities in a really substantial way in order to get those productivity gains and that the numbers here um, speak for themselves, I think. So we shouldn't be kidding ourselves that this is a simple task. This is, this is not about sort of business as usual and kind of ticking along. This is about a sea change in the way that we think about economic development and the way our model needs to be set up. And then the other thing I just want to highlight before I hand over to Diane is that there's, there's clearly, it, this isn't all about upsides. There's, there's a huge upside to improving productivity and um, balancing out some of our regional gaps. But there are some real downsides too. And the one that was most striking, I think, we've done some qualitative work as well as lots of quantitative work over the last year. But one of the most striking things was the pressure that growing cities and becoming more productive and more prosperous would place on housing. Um, this chart showing you the change in local authority house prices um, by pay over the last um, 15 years or so. And, I mean, the upward slope is basically telling you that the more pay you have in an area, the faster the house prices rise. You get this kind of wedge opening up fundamentally as cities become more prosperous between their house prices and those of, of less prosperous places. And that is not brilliant if you're not on a great income to begin with in that city. And it's also not brilliant if you want to move to that city, which is really important because one of the things we've just talked about is we do want people moving and we do want mobility improving. So tackling the issues of housing along as an integrated part of a, of a growth strategy is incredibly important. And then the second thing I want to highlight as a kind of a potential risk is who gains from these opportunities. Um, this is a chart we produced in, in another one of our reports um, when we were looking at, at Yorkshire and Humberside. And I think it's really fascinating. So again, let me, let me explain just what it's showing you. Um, what it's showing you is... Um, how many, what percentage of, of people leave their local authority, um, so outward migrate from their local authority, um, at certain ages, so the ages along the x-axis, um, and, and it's contingent on whether their local authority is deprived or less deprived. And the standout here, of course, is what happens around 18 or 19, which, of course, is a critical transition point for lots of people. And you can see that if you live in, a, in one of the, in the least deprived quintile of local authorities, the most affluent places in the UK, almost half of, of young people leave at that point. And I think we can kind of speculate quite clearly that they're generally leaving for higher education. If you look at the poorest um, quintile, which is the red line, that's around about 16, 17%. So we're doing something that means that young people from our poorer areas are not able to leave, are not able to get educational opportunities, and are not able to benefit from, from um, the opportunities that exist, and we hope will more, there will be more of them in the future. Let me draw this to a close. So what are we saying fundamentally in the Economy 2030 report? Well, we're, we're saying we should be building on rather than embarrassed by the UK service specialism. And that is really key to national prosperity. And it's also the basis for turning our levelling up rhetoric into reality because it, it demands us putting great cities centre forward. It, it, it requires that. That is the nature of the model. So it's there in its, in its essence. But it does bring huge challenges, it huge challenges when it comes to investment, when it comes to prioritisation, when it comes to human capital. Um, and we need to be really honest about that, and we need to be honest as well about that there are genuine downsides and there will be genuine losers from this process, and how do we protect those losers in the best possible way? And as the slide says, the goal is clearly to navigate that tension and to raise national growth and lower inequality between regions without pushing it up within regions. I want to go back to something that looks like my first slide and think, well, what, what is the prize of this process? Well, the prize is absolutely enormous, actually. So this is a, this is a um, slide which is thinking about, well, what would, what would incomes look like in the UK across the distribution if we could perform as well as five sort of middle-ranking comparative countries? So Australia, Canada, France, Germany, and the Netherlands averaged out. And this is saying, well, what would the impact look like on incomes if, if um, our income levels went up? And basically, you can see it's, it's around about 20%. If we, could, if we could match the performance of those countries just on our growth levels, we'd, we'd see incomes go up by 20%. What would it look like if we could redistribute in the same way that they do? Well, that, that, again, the picture's very clear. There's real gains, especially for those on lower incomes. 
Um, if we could have the same levels of inequality as those five countries, this is what it would look like. But put them together, and this is what it looks like. So it looks like gains for everyone, but of course those gains are very much for, for people on the lowest incomes and also at middle income level. So the prize is very significant. Um, the challenge, I don't underestimate. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Over to you, Diane. Well, I'm going to inflict just a few more charts on you. It's always a pleasure to be asked to do an event like this. Uh, I was involved in the in Manchester Independent Economic Review back in 2008, and I grew up in Ramsbottom. So any excuse to, uh, to, to come and talk about the future of Greater Manchester. Um, so the, um, we had a, I had a very distinguished set of panellists on the review, and we've got this refresh now, and I'm just going to share with you a few of the insights from the refresh, but please do read the whole thing, because I've got maximum five minutes to talk to you now, um, which if you've had enough charts already, you might think is plenty. Um, so we uh, did this original prosperity review 10 years on from the, the MIA, and the idea was to uh, refresh the evidence and understand how priorities and needs in Greater Manchester ought to change. But the basic message was that the thing that matters is, um, and, and it covered these seven areas, and I'm skipping through these because it's all in the document, the thing that matters is productivity. Now, economists talk about productivity all the time, and what we mean is for the resources that we use, all the resources, um, what output that's valuable to us do we get out of that? And that's very different from what some other people mean when they talk about productivity. Some people mean it's cost-cutting. Um, how can you get the same output but make it less costly to do and increase your profits? Engineers talk about it in a, um, a sort of mechanical way, if you like, that um, you're thinking about the volume of things that you can get out or the volume of inputs. For economists, it's, it's what do you get out that people value. So it's a bit different. And the reason it matters is that all of the improvements in living standards over time that we've enjoyed, uh, longer life expectancy, better health, all the amenities that we have access to, warmer houses, all of that has come about because of productivity growth. And before we had productivity growth, which came with the Industrial Revolution, uh, driven by this great city, of course, um, it was, it was a, a subsistence existence for, for many centuries. So that's why it matters, and it's why we harp on about it. If we want higher wages, we want better quality jobs, um, we need the productivity. Now, there's a bit of good news in that in recently, Greater Manchester has done a bit better on productivity than the rest of the UK. But the gap between cities is still very large. And actually, that's cold comfort because the UK as a whole has been doing really poorly in terms of productivity. It has basically flatlined um, since uh, around 2007. It's called the productivity puzzle because we don't really know why it's happened. And there has been a slowdown in lots of countries, so there are global factors going on, but um, we're doing worse than others. So uh, it, this is good news in a way, but there's also still a huge productivity challenge. Um, I've somehow managed to break the computer, which is not very productive. There we go. Um, one of the things that I want to highlight is the importance of health in all of this. Um, it's part of what economists in our usual poetic way call human capital, and um, it's very closely linked to labour market outcomes. One of the pieces of research carried out for this refresh found this staggering figure, 75% of the variance in employment rates across the parts of Greater Manchester could be accounted for by health. Now, that's very high, and... Um, other studies might find somewhat different figures, but the basic point is that health does really matter. And I want to show you a chart um, on inactivity. This is adult inactivity um, in two, uh, 2019 and 2021. And you can see that across boroughs it has increased. This is a national picture. In other countries, inactivity went up during the pandemic and then it went back down again. And so we've got a low unemployment rate, but high inactivity. In other countries that we would compare ourselves to, inactivity has gone back down to where it was before the pandemic, and that hasn't happened here. And it seems in, uh, very likely that um, ill health is related to that. Um, you know, people are not going to be able to do 
uh, challenging and um, high-skilled jobs or challenging and, quote, low-skilled jobs if they've got a bad back or a hip replacement that they're on a, a waiting list for or they are affected by air pollution and have asthma, all of those kinds of issues that we know are so unequal across different parts of the city region and, and other cities too. It's a, a real dimension of inequality that matters. So um, that's one of the focuses and maybe that's something that we can pick up on. Unemployment, um, quite a varied picture across the boroughs. The national rate is quite low. Um, you can see that it's gone up in um, uh, uh, some parts of Manchester in, in particular. Um, but, but that co coincides with skill shortages. So there's something that's not functioning very well about the labour market. And so we might be thinking about um, what's, what, what are we going to do about the skill shortages and in all kinds of jobs, progressing people's skills, creating lifetime opportunities, responding to changes in the economy and changes in technology. So that's another of the challenges. Um, and then uh, the transition to net zero. This is a chart, I forgot to the chart, no. The chart uh, comes from um, the Grantham Institute at the university, and it, the dark part of this shows um, what carbon emissions ought to be in Greater Manchester if we're going to get to the target by 2038. And the pale colour shows what's been spent so far out of that budget. So that requires some adjustment. Now, that's not easy because it's hard for any city to do this by itself. It's part of a national and a global picture. But I want to add there are other parts of the environment that really matter and that link to the health points that I was just making. Pollution kills. So transitioning to electric vehicles as quickly as possible and cycling and walking as much as possible it's going to be good for carbon. It's also going to be good for health. So let's think about the pollution as much as we think about the carbon. And access to green space. City centre parks are really important. Um, it's important for people's health, for the clean air, for mental health, but also because it's an amenity that brings in and attracts people with high skills and retains people with high skills who might um, then live, find the city a better place to live. Um, so there is going to be more follow-up research. There are challenges, and um, Lindsay started highlighting some of those. There are choices to be made. If we want to step up, have that higher productivity and higher living standards that go with it, that means there will need to be more housing, for example. So there are questions that come along with that. So thinking about the trade-offs, this is an evidence review that helps think about those. Um, I'm sure there will be more updates coming from the team over time in terms of what they're monitoring. Um, uh, but please do read it, and I hope we can pick up on some of those points in the conversation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Diane. <laughs> so you've had, you've had the national economic strategy. You've had some of the... Input, it's all right, smash, you smashed it at exactly the right time. Uh, we're at the end of the slides, smash it all. Uh, the, um, uh, and well done, by the way, people at the back who've been craning their necks to see those slides, you get a lot of prizes, but also that's what happens when you don't sit at the front. The um, crime leads to punishment. It's an important lesson to learn. Right, now, the, um, that's the national picture. That's the, some of the evidence base for the local picture. You've decided to become the person responsible for leading Manchester and large parts of Greater Manchester, just as we... And emerge from the pandemic? What's the answer there? Well, it's a million dollar question, isn't it? Um, but I think, so first of all, I'd begin by welcoming the reports that we've seen um, today. I think what it does for us here in Great Manchester is demonstrate, I suppose, the, the longevity, but the success that can come with having a longevity of vision. And I think particularly at this time, when it feels that there is so much uncertainty, not just economic uncertainty, but uncertainty across all spheres, that actually being able to talk about long-term plans in some ways is really quite refreshing. Um, and that's with, without me making any comments on the government of the day. Um, but I think, so, so from my perspective, th there's a few things in terms of context for me that's really important within some of this. Um, and leading the city of Manchester, but also leading across GM on economy, business and international, it's something that I get to see in terms of the strengths that we have in our city region. And I think that goes back. It goes back to the depth and maturity that we have here in Greater Manchester about recognising that some of the dangers we're seeing now about just talking about growth 
without understanding what that's rooted in, what creates growth, but also what kind of growth that you want to see and who benefits from that growth is a really fundamental point that should drive any kind of economic strategy um, that you would seek to achieve. And I think that that's really cannot be overstated at the moment. And, and in Greater Manchester, we, we will never take a position that is simply growth at all costs that damages our communities and leaves people behind, but finding a way of being able to harness growth to make sure that people have opportunities, but also that we create the thriving place that we want to see. Um, so for those of you that follow us closely, you'll know that Greater Manchester has recently launched its refreshed Greater Manchester strategy. And in that, essentially tries to give many, many solutions to much of GM's problems. But the reason that we're here today is that we want to use some of this as a touchstone as we begin to refresh our local industrial strategy that we have in GM. And the timing of it actually could never be more important. You know, I've uh, been an elected councillor now for well over a decade, and in that iteration, we've had iterations of powerhouse, we've had, you know, discussions around levelling up, um, we've now got growth locations, and having a clear economic vision and an economic plan that talks about how you create a greener, fairer, and more prosperous um, city region has to be fundamental to that. So there's a couple of things just that I wanted to specifically draw out. Um, and I think the first thing will be around the context that we find ourselves in the moment and the impact that that will create both for our communities but also for our economy. And that, of course, is the cost of living crisis, or the cost of doing business crisis, or whatever punchy headline you like to give it. But ultimately what that also shows is that actually structurally... In places like Manchester and Greater Manchester, we've had some serious problems for a long period of time that we've been grappling with when we talk about our economic strategy. So in the report, you'll see referenced um, some, some data analysis that's done on the basis of 2019 Mosaic Experian data that talks about household income in GM. We delved into this in the city of Manchester a little bit deeper. So those not a fay with our um, really exciting administrative boundaries, the city of Manchester comprises of 600,000 people to GM's 2.8 million. So of that 600,000 people, we did a calculation on the basis of people, people's income. Um, for the data geeks amongst you, um, kind of the weakness in this is that it assumes two adults and two children. For the demographics of a city like Manchester, we know our families are much bigger than that. But we looked at what happens when you pay on the basis of your income, you pay your rent, the average rent, you pay average energy costs on April 22 prices, um, and you also pay your average food, food bill at that same time. And we find that over 22% of Manchester residents had less than 30 quid a month disposable income after rent, after gas and electricity, and after food to live on. We find that that goes up to 46% when you look at people that have less than £124 a month to manage that. That's getting yourself to work, that's getting your kids to school, that's paying for uniforms, that's paying for broadbands, new phones, washing machine breaks. So actually, the real stresses that our communities feel, to me, has to be that fundamental driver of when Manchester and Great Manchester talk about growing our economy, we talk about productivity, we talk about attracting new businesses and investments. It has to be firmly rooted in the values as to why you're doing that and what you're doing that for. And if you think about the growth that we've seen here in the city, a population growth of nearly 200,000 people over the course of 20 years, we've radically reshaped what that skills profile looked like. So back in 2004, nearly a quarter of our residents had no skills qualifications at all. That's now 6%. We have one of the highest graduate retentions in terms of cities across the country, at over 50%. So there are some strides that have been taken that require long-term approaches. And some of the clear focuses that we've given around are key areas of growth in terms of, you might jazzily call them frontier economies. If you're an economist, you like to read lots of lengthy documents. But those highly skilled high value, which is a quite a problematic term, which we'll come on to, sectors have been at the forefront of how we've talked about our economic strategy in this country for much too long. But what about all the other stuff? What about the things that look after your mum and dad, look after your kids um, before they go to school, where you go to buy your food, where servicing the economy is something that's quite fundamental? That's something in GM that we've been quite keen not to lose sight of. It won't ne neatly fit into a productivity box, 
but in terms of functionality of society is vital. And that's why some of the work that we've been doing around the likes of the Good Employment Charter, the works that we've been doing with the Real Living Wage, where there were 500 businesses in GM city region that were already accredited and we're asking many more to come on that journey, is not losing sight that actually you can go after the long-term prize of having a more equally distributed, balanced regional economy that has high productivity, that has high growth and contributes to the overall UK economy but you can also look at what you do to support everyone else that functions in the economy. And I'd just say three brief other points around the connectivity of other issues when we talk about jobs, skills um, and work. And health is fundamental. Obviously, the Health Foundation have released a report that's shown direct impacts that devolution can have on life expectancy at a time when the rest of the country was going backwards. Here in GM, we were able to deliver that. The need to have more affordable housing in a way that um, we'll be arguing for even more powers through devolution, but we're already cracking on in delivering council and social homes here in the city and across GM. And then, of course, transport. So obviously much has been made around our cap on fares, ability to put money right into people's pockets when they need it most, but not losing sight of some of those long-term discussions with government that we need to have about structural capital investment into our infrastructure in this country. That would see not just high speed to, but see northern powerhouse rail and investment in the capacity that we need to be able to enhance our public sector. So this, this is really welcome. I think it's a really important time, but it's also a really important time to reassure people that actually much of our original aim, despite the flavours of the day, hasn't actually shifted. There's clear focus around how we achieve that. And we're now in that phase where actually we're able to show some of the fruits of our labour in terms of what we're delivering for the people of Greater Manchester. Great. Thank you, Bev. <laughs> Now you're going to hear from Lou, who is not only the chair of the uh, LEP, but has set up and run an actual real-life business. It's very exciting. Tell us all about it, Lou. I'm only 23. I just look this way because I've run a business for two years. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'll, I'll maybe just add, for, for the purposes of stimulating hopefully a bit of debate, because it would be really interesting to make the most of um, the people who are with us today um, for, for some challenging questions, and maybe a bit around the business perspective on that. Um, and... Uh, with the caveat, I am an economist by trade, so I'm not in a Disney world. A bit about opportunity and um, hopefully a bit of hope. So, um, so, so as you say, I mean, I, I founded a business in, in this city 25 years ago. I, I think safe to say uh, anybody who's running any kind of business or an SME has never had a moment like the one that we find ourselves in. I, I was looking at um, some data uh, the other day that took 350,000 businesses that turned over about a million quid, make about 90k profit. In, as they went into the pandemic, survived the pandemic, come out of that, if all costs stay the same, which they won't, and just energy doubles, they lose, on average, about a quarter of a million pounds a year. So that's 300 plus thousand businesses that possibly disappear. So, so an extraordinary moment of challenge, uh, which we described the other day as 99 problems and inflation is just one of them. You know? so, so I think th this crazy, and, and leaders are tired, people have run a business in a pandemic, you know, th there's not a lot to draw on, um, both, both financially and, and kind of morally, but um, we're largely a tenacious bunch, you know, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure we'll, we'll do our best. But I think you know, th this extraordinary moment of challenge, and then in that, you know, what the pandemic brought, w which was... 10 years of change in 10 months. So, so we were going to go through this transition and many of the kind of economic changes and the transition of our economy towards green jobs and all of those things we knew were coming. We just thought we had a much longer period to kind of adjust to it. Um, so, so I think where, where we find ourselves now as, a, as an economy is, is actually we've, we're in a really important moment of clarity and ambition and making those decisions about what we do next. And in a sense, you know, the responsibility of, of, of some of the conversations that, that we're having and some of the work that, that we're sharing today is to stimulate that strategy and that thought and give ourselves the best chance of achieving that stage of, of the ambition. I think for us, you know, as we will always do in Grace Master, we'll play to our strengths. And I think, you know, we're, we're quite clear actually on where our distinctiveness is. Aside from, as Beth said, probably the most politically stable part of the UK, which we'll, we'll take and allows us actually to take possibly the exception. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not putting out that the SNP has got like basically 99%. We'll, we'll arm wrestle them for that position. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that, you know, that opportunity actually to plan long term and do what we've always done. But we're definitely at a moment where how we drove growth for the last 20 years is not going to be how we do that for the next 20. So, so I think 
Um, but that's an opportunity, right? And, and I think the vision that, that we have for the kind of growth that we want out of the next 20 years is as best as one that works for all people and for the planet. And we've set that out quite boldly. I spend a lot of my time on the front line with the people who might bring the money and the jobs and looking them in the eye and trying to understand what it is that, that they want and understanding those people. Honestly, the most heartening thing is that I think we're at a point where that's not going to be a choice that's detrimental to our economic growth. It's massively advantageous because I think the pandemic has changed people's value set. It's changed businesses' relationship with its employees. It's changed businesses' ambition. In some cases, it's forced business to change. In some cases, business leaders now genuinely value a different set of success measures. And I think Greater Manchester is uniquely positioned because we believe those things and we've stood on those shoulders for a really long time. So it's an authentic story, not one we plucked out of the air, um, to offer those kind of organisations a place and, a, and a, an opportunity to um, work with our citizens and, and to work with our local economy to, um, to grow their business and, and grow ourselves um, in a way that um, we can be proud of, you know, that does work for everybody. So, so I think... From my perspective, you know, I will always say, like, if you're going to be in a crisis, this is probably the best place <laughs> in the country to be in one because um, you know, we, we are having meaningful conversations about how we take that forward. But I think also, in terms of a unique proposition, if, if we get that, that proposition right, that has massive advantages for the UK economy because we're going to be the only place that can offer that and a place for inward investment to turn up and find a home that shares a value set. So I'll probably leave it there. Thank you, Lou. So, as you can see, Louis is quite perky, which is how she's managed to run a business for 25 years. Henry is an economic geographer. <laughs> now, that isn't their natural starting point. Henry, over to you. No, so, uh, I mean, let me start by saying how nice it is to be back here. I, Torsten's joke about me being London-based aside, I, this is the 15th year for me of being involved uh, with trying to formulate economic strategy uh, in Manchester. First with the Mir, then with the Independent Prosperity Review. Uh, I, maybe that means nothing to you, so here's something else. I tried and failed to move my family here in 2012 for reasons that I won't go into. Uh, I like Manchester. Um, so let me just highlight, I think, three, three things maybe. Uh, so the first thing, uh, which I think you know, is a message that is clearly coming out in the economy uh, 2030, stuff that Lindsay presented, but is also uh, very clearly coming out in the Independent Prosperity Review uh, refresh that Diane talked us through. Uh, you, We've got to do something about both growth and inequality, okay? I, I really think, you know, the key message is you've got to think keeping about both. Uh, there's no point in having growth if it's at the cost of, you know, massively widening inequality. I don't know, think 45 pence tax rate cuts. Um, but you also can't tackle inequality, you know, the sort of major investments that are needed without growth. So, we, you know, we have got to have something that does, that hits at both. And I think that the Economy 2030 is, is grappling with that uh, as, a, as a people here in GM. Uh, the second point I want to make is just about sustainability, um, because I think, you know, that's, that's crucially important. I mean, let me just raise one challenge here. I don't personally understand why any local area would have a decarbonizing target that was much faster than the national target, all right? Um, and I'm, I'm happy to go into the reasons for that. Let me do the more positive thing. I think the, the crucial thing from a GM perspective, if it decides to stick to that target, is that it doesn't miss the opportunities that come from investing in the green economy and doing stuff that will drive down carbon emissions elsewhere uh, and generate jobs and opportunities here, okay? And I think there needs to be as much focus on that as there is uh, on decarbonizing, because I think both are crucially important for uh, reaching sustainability. Um, the third point I wanted to make is, um, you know, I obviously agree with Lindsay's assessment that we're a service superpower. And the crucial part of the UK's economic strategy is about making sure that cities outside of London can grow quicker. The thing I think that we're in danger always of dodging is that I don't think that's lots of places. I think that's probably one or two, being realistic. And I think the big question for Manchester uh, is that, you know, being a world city, you know, requires being a lot bigger, being a lot more high-skilled, lots more investment. 
Uh, and I think it's a question of whether or not GM wants to step up to that. And stepping up here is, does it have the appetite? But it's also, does it have the powers? And does it have the strategy to both deliver on growth and, as Bev rightly says, make sure as many people as possible are able to engage in the opportunities that, that you know, that, that, that would generate? Uh, so I think that that's my third point. And let me just finish with a, with a fourth uh, and then open it up to discussion. With what's going on at the national level, um, what GM and other local areas decide to do is going to be more important than ever. And so it's crucial that we get it right. And um, reports like the two we're launching this evening and events like, uh, like this are a part of the mission of making sure that we do that. Very good. Thank you, Henry. That was, uh, I thought it was pretty perky, actually. So, you know, if we all can defy our stereotypes. Now, I like um, being in Manchester. And you like being in Manchester, that's perked you up, but you didn't manage to move here. We all make mistakes. Still time, Henry, still time. Right, now, we've got loads of great questions coming in. Just to remind you, it is hashtag Greater Manchester, because we're all very imaginative on Slido, if you want to add them. There's loads of really good questions. We've got about 50 minutes. So what I'm basically going to do is try to blitz through as many, of, and you're going to, yeah, it's going to have to give proper answers, both. <laughs> Proper answers. Don't worry, it's why I'm in local politics. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> what could you? Okay, very good. Okay, so let's take a. Uh, uh, let's um, let's take these in chunks. So there's there's a few. So let's do first of all, let's do services. So um, there's a few questions which I'm going to try to bring up on the screen here. If I can make the oh god, what have I done it? Right, we're going to come up on the screen. Looking at Tara, I might come up on the screen. I'm going to read it while I wait for it to come up on the screen because we're a low productivity okay. uh, thing. Here we go. Oh my God, it's worked. Right. Okay. Is the UK actually a service superpower or is it just financial services doing all the work? But there's a related one to take at the same time. If I can go and make this work. Here we go, which is basically finance is useless. We should stop it. The, um, uh, now, why don't we, um, I mean, it's not, it doesn't quite say that, but it basically says that. No, so, who, Lindsay or Henry? Henry, do you want to do this from the, we did a grapple in the inquiry. Yeah, with I mean, but, but this is quick. It's not just financial services. We, we have, re in fact, if anything, it's, it's increasingly not financial services. We have really good strengths across a whole range of uh, service activity. So it's not, this is not just a story about financial services. In fact, if anything, I would personally be with the, it's the other stuff that I would it's like to see us expand. And if you don't like financial services, don't worry, because we've just had a massive financial crisis and we've, <laughs> left. and we've left the EU. So don't worry, they're going to be hammering our financial services for years. So focus on the other stuff, like design or universities. You've got two service sectors sitting on the panel. Uh, those of us are from think tanks or from uh, government are just parasites on that. <laughs> the, um, right, now. It's right, it's always good fun. Right, now, um, what about, here's one on, um, uh, for you, Bev, which is, again, if I can find it, which is basically, here we go, the most popular question, so you're going to have to answer it straight. You can't see it, so I'll read it out. Gov the government's new local growth strategy, someone's being nice calling it that, is a low-tax, low-regulation <laughs> investment <laughs> zones, taking the offer as read... I mean, if you've managed to read it and understand it, you've done very well, because I think you've got to submit interest in, like, tomorrow with no Yay. details of the policy. <laughs> but anyway, basically, can you make it work for GM? What are you going to be deregulating, low-taxing? or can, What are you going to snaffle out of this, basically? <laughs> um, right, so I'll begin by saying that I'm not a big fan of the Hunger Games, and it feels like interacting with government recently <laughs> has been a little bit like the Hunger Games. So I think uh, we've all learned our lessons of levelling up. Um, look, look, I'll be really honest, the, the clarity so far around investment zones is pretty, pretty weak. I think, for me, um, there are some clear red lines in Greater Manchester that we are um, going to be really quite clear about when they actually let us. At the moment, it's a form, and the form says, are you interested? Do you want to have a chat? The answer? the answer is yes, we're interested, we'll have a chat, but we've got some things that we're not very comfortable or happy with and things that we'll say no on that basis. So for me, in a city like Manchester, to not be going anywhere near any of the planning stuff that basically carte blanche allows people to roll in 
um, and to work against what we have in terms of master plan and strategic ready, ready regeneration framework. Stuff around environmental, commi environmental commitments, we've been through the pain of places for everyone for quite some time. We've come up with a plan, so if it doesn't fit to that, we're not interested. Uh, we won't accept the rolling back of employment rights, and what we're not keen for in Greater Manchester is to take from Thameside to give to Rochdale. That doesn't work for anybody. But where there could be an interest, and this is where chatting to other city leaders across the UK, is that if we're talking about something that is a more thought through version, that's an expanded version of what we have with enterprise zones, then actually there are some opportunities in there and there are some localities within GM that would work. So we've said that we're interested, but show us what you've got. We'll put forward our growth locations on the basis that we already have a plan, but we've got some pretty firm rules and we're not afraid to say no. Good. The, um, so does that mean, this is unfair, but is it, so does that mean we'd like the ta lower tax bit, but not the other stuff? Um, it depends, because um, when you say lower taxes, it depends who pays the lower taxes and where it goes. Um, the problem that we have, and this to me explains the last decade um, of, of challenges, but particularly exacerbated in the last two or three years, is the competitiveness between areas. So we've had it with local authorities, we've had to do beauty pageants for quite some time, show a bit of lag, get a bit of money, um, and celebrate because the other city didn't get it, you got it. The risk is, and that's where I smirked when you say strategy, because if investment zones are actually the strategy around economic growth, then nothing will grow, things will become displaced. And that's the risk that we have to see. So I don't actually think it's about taxation, it's around consistency across the piece. Very good. Uh, yes. Look, she answered the question, people. That's what you see. Now, the, uh, Diane, why don't you take this one, which is... Uh, big picture, so Greater Manchester is currently negotiating with government on more devolution. What would you, what's your top ask to combat the stagnation we've talked about? What's the, what would you want devolved? What's your top on the list? I think the very top would be um, some hint of strategy, strategic thinking being long term from the government and particularly in funding. And uh, we're asking businesses to make investment decisions that have at least a five-year horizon. We're asking individuals to make investments in their own training that have long-term implications for their whole lifetime earnings and career. And the government changes its plan all the time. So we've got the growth plan. It was the plan for growth a year ago. It was an industrial strategy before that. It is an absolute joke. So just um, some consistency over time, in, um, and particularly in funding, um, things like transport, you can't, fund, you, can't, you can't plan short term. But I was a school governor for many years. We didn't learn our current budget until halfway through the current fiscal year. And as governors, you're supposed to do a five-year financial plan. It's just an absolute joke. So that's my top ask. So long-term financing, basically, is the top. Right, good. The, um, I'm also a school governor. We are going bust. So don't get me in charge yeah. of your... Uh, uh, anyway, the, uh, your finances. Right. Um, uh, Lou, why don't you take this one as... This one is as the representative of the world of businesses, if I can find it. Here we go. Which is basically... So you run a service business. The question is, why do we think services are downplayed in UK economic strategy and policy? And would a clearer focus on it actually help? Here's another way of putting it. Which is when I talk to politicians even the local ones, obviously mainly the national ones, but even the local ones, they basically often say a pop version of the problem with Britain is it's just about banking, and the answer is it should be about manufacturing. <laughs> I think a bit unfair, but that is basically what they um, say, despite there being, what, what was it, 8% of the workforce is now in manufacturing? The, um, so it's like ruling out 92% of the workforce. So why do we say that, I think if you accept that caricature of what politicians yeah. say, which obviously you should. Obviously. Uh, I think, one, we have a bit of a punch on for making things, you know, so things we can touch and feel. But I think from a, from a GM perspective, and many other city regions up and down, we, we've made a decision quite a long time ago, whether we called it industrial strategy or whatever we called it, that actually we had some very clear priority sectors that we wanted to grow in to create long-term sustained growth that was evidence-based and very considered. And the service economy has a part to play in that. Even if you're looking at science tech, there is, there is a service economy around science and tech that is very important, but, but is not as central as uh, the organisations generating the R&D and the IP and the, you know, the component. Without, without those, there is nothing to service. So, so I, think, um, I think we do downplay it, but I'm not sure, and, and I can say this, can't I, that that's... Um, I think we should continue to downplay it slightly because I do think actually the, the long-term growth around science and technology um, as, as one of those examples around health innovation, around creating, you know, the things that we've identified here as being critical 
uh, they're, they're the right things to be backing. Uh, and if we, you know, if, if you take a very long-term view, which is we should be doing the, the things that the machines can't, because really in 20 years that's where the jobs will be, there are vast components of the service industries that will be done by machines. You know, if you look at legal services, if you look at consultancy <laughs> services, you know, AI w will do a huge amount and automate a huge amount of that. So it's quite a dangerous long-term strategy to to be in a place that isn't around original thought and original IP and original creativity um, to, to go. We should, we should do things computers won't eventually be able to do. Mm. Good. Now, Bev, here's a hard one for you that I'll give to you and to Lindsay, which is about whether you want the middle-aged, basically. The, um, so here you go. So you're going to have to let me read that. So the first one, it doesn't, it doesn't say that. It says, there's a virtuous, oh, it says virtuous. Oh. I thought it said vicious. It actually says virtuous cycle of London drawing graduates in and then it's a vicious cycle for other cities because many older professionals move north from London. Boo, that's you, Henry. Uh, but how do we <laughs> how do we get? We don't want the middle-aged ones. How do we attract more young professionals? What can Manchester or Greater Manchester offer over London? How do we stop the sicko brain drain? The, um, and there's another one that's related to this, which, if I can find it, is at least uh, funny. The um, uh, blah, 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 blah. here we go. The um, which is pro midlife in an aging society to build productivity, we need to make more of financial, social, human capital of people in midlife. That's me, yes. How well positioned, so basically, how are you going to get the young so or the middle aged? The well, there's no oldies in this, but like, right. okay, well, I'll, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be nice. More young, more people. Well, we, we are a city region that's world-renowned for our older person's uh, strategy and recognised by the UN in doing so. So I'll, uh, I'll play to all my audiences. Um, uh, look, I think, I, think, I think we're on to something in Manchester. You know, and I, I'm not just glibly talking about the three Time Out articles that said Manchester is cool and hip and it's a place to go, or the Economist's international ranking that put Manchester above London in the Global Livability Index, the top UK city. Um, but, but, I mean, I, I could go on, but I won't in the interest of time. But there's, there's something for me that there's, there's key components as to what attracts people, but also what, what makes people stay. So I came to Manchester from Belfast for uni. All of my mates went to London. Um, I realised, oh, I could get a better paid job in London. But then I realised that, oh, I lived in city centre in Manchester in a nice um, two-bed apartment, or I could go and live in a house share with six people in zone four for three times the price. That was then because there was a challenge with jobs. So I think it's jobs and opportunities, um, not just graduate retention, retention, but career progression. It's about homes and communities and places that people want to live. But also we've gone big on culture. You know, the Factory International is opening next year. Um, you know, say what you like about a local authority choosing to build a project that's going to cost over £200 million. We have had government grant and subsidy in that. But that's part of Manchester's cultural offer that recognises you can build loads of flats, you can create lots of offices, but actually if the quality of life isn't good, you need to tap into that. And that's something that isn't just a Manchester city centre thing, that's something across GM. You know, places like Ramsbottom are thriving, speaking to the midlife audience, particularly people citing the relocation of the BBC. But that, to me, gets to the nub of where you can have a city and where you have thriving places around it, be it some of the fantastic stuff that's happening in Stockport at the minute, where actually they're harnessing the affluence of their population by creating an offer that keeps people there. So create good quality places, but keep the jobs there to retain them. And some of that does it for itself, but then some of it does need um, the very confident articulation as to what's happening in an area when somebody might have left us 20 years ago um, and thought that a fancy night out was going to the Dutch pancake house. So the world has changed. <laughs> Which it was. Thanks. I mean, I loved... I loved <laughs> nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I loved the Dutch pancake Some of the best friends are in the pancake house. Right. Uh, Lindsay, just from a slightly bigger perspective for the UK as a whole. People moving around, midlife youth, what do we want? Well, I think, I, think, um, I think Bev's sort of hit it really right, that it's, it, in some ways it's a bit baffling as to why lots of Londoners don't come and live in Manchester when you look at the housing costs. And we, and we know that the sort of differential housing costs act as a real sort of grit in, the, grit in the machine when it comes to mobility. I mean, I, if, I, if I may speak about something from Yorkshire in Lancashire, which feels very dangerous. Um, I mean, we did some really interesting qualitative work um, as part of the, of the first phase of the Economy 2030 inquiry, um, talking to people about their place and what kept them there and what, what would make them move away. And one of the things that was 
was really striking was people talking about the quality of their city centre. So I think this speaks to what you were just saying, Bev, about amenities. And there was a real sense in lots of places that if your city centre or the kind of physical space, your, your public realm was kind of hollowed out or degraded, then that wasn't going to draw either you or indeed more money into the city centres. And that was a real problem. And you ended up in a, a vicious circle in this case where you had the degradation feeding through to exodus, feeding through to people not coming in and spending more money. So I think that there's a, a lot to be said on the housing side. There's a lot to be said on the media side. But of course, at the end of the day, it is fundamentally about jobs. Right, one question each then for Henry and then for Diane before we wrap up. So Henry, the first one for you, last for you, and I'll bring them both up so you get a warning, Diane, which is, Henry, why shouldn't regions set more challenging net zero targets, comma, you meanie? And then, uh, uh, Diane, yours is education and skills, which we haven't touched on human capital much, but basically, how to improve education across GM boroughs, human capital and productivity gains, when we talk about attracting high-skilled, high-wage jobs, how about we get some homegrown, which you've talked about a lot before. So, Henry, first, can't we decarbonise Greater Manchester to solve the planet? Uh, look, so, I, I'm going to preface this by saying that I think net zero is hugely important. I recognise all the issues, etc. It's just that things that GM does will be swamped by Trump if he gets re-elected. There you go, now we're getting depressed. Uh, or China, right? Or other bit, you know... Uh, so. And it's, for me, it's about, you know, where are you going to spend, you know, you're operating within a fixed funding envelope, so where are you going to spend the marginal pound? And, you know, if I was GM, I would be spending it on things at lower pollution, you know, so in that space, I would be spending it on parks and things that lower pollution and things that really deliver a direct benefit to GM residents. Now, some of those things overlap, right? Like, uh, better insulating homes, where it's you know hugely important for people in terms of the cost of living crisis, um, and you know just how warm their homes are and livable. But some of those things don't. And if I you know if I face something uh, where you know where the choice was between doing something that benefited the local population versus something that did uh, did something to help you achieve some 19 uh, 2038 carbon target, I would do the thing that benefited the local population. Good. Diane. So I think um, attracting high-skilled workers to a wonderful city and growing high skills within that wonderful city region are not mutually exclusive things. You can do them both. And uh, there are some things that we do know about how to improve educational outcomes. Uh, you start early. Um, you do spend money. The London Challenge involves spending money, but it also involved sharing best practices across schools. So it's not that... Um, there's no knowledge about how to do it, but it's a long-term thing. And actually, I think it's much more likely to happen somewhere like here than it is at the national level when um, it's all about the next tweet. Stop tweeting, people. Right. The, uh, like, last question then for Bev as our uh, representative of the people. The, um, so let's take these as a... Let's take these... No pressure. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's democracy. We're yeah. through that. The, um, Liz Truss is also a representative of the people. Uh, actually, that'll teach you. Yeah, Not quite the same way. Can't be half... You've got to be pro-some democracy, people. Take it when you lose, even with Donald Trump. Right. The, um, so let's take a set of these for you, Bev, which are hard. So first of all... Um, with the GM spatial strategy struggling to deliver housing growth, she's going to say it's not totally struggling, but anyway, but with the GM strategy struggling to deliver loads of housing growth, does GM actually want to? Can it grow to be a world city, or are we just pretending, basically? Okay. What are you going to do about planning barriers? Then the flips the exact opposite of that argument from the people's powerhouse, who says, does economic growth have to be achieved by gentrifying, I think that's in the pejorative sense of gentrification, of Greater Manchester's community, or is there another way forward? So those are quite big pictures to wrap up on. So basically, what are we going to do? Do we want loads of change in growth, or is it going to be a disaster? Right, well, it's not going to be a disaster. I think I'm here to reassure you. Um, no, no, look, I think there's, there's a couple of things for me. So I think there's, there, there will be pace, um, and the reason that we went through quite a painfully slow um, planning process as part of Places for Everyone was to get the balance right of things that we were comfortable with. Um, so there is a reason, and there are trade-offs to be made, that much of the density will come, particularly in the city of Manchester. Um, so we will see more um, supply added to Manchester city centre that will cover some of that um, growth of density as part of that. There are a number of key challenges, though, and it speaks quickly to the trailblazer question before, of levers that we need within our control to be able to do the things that we want or need. Um, so the rented sector 
has gone through the roof since the government capped LHI. There's now only one ward out of 32 in the city of Manchester where average rents are beneath the local housing allowance. We need to be doing something pretty urgently about that because that's creating a massive drain on our ability to influence um, within the housing stock in some of those sectors. Um, the second is around housing. We have an ambitious ambitious target at GM around the number of social homes that are zero carbon that we will build. We've just built the first zero carbon zero, oh, sorry again, zero carbon social home in East Manchester. It was expensive. So actually the ability to deliver that will require capacity that are levers from, from government, that are capital funding, um, and that will engage more closely with our piece of private sector. Low carbon achieving its scale will be something we'll be able to do quicker. And we're already on site on a number of those. But, but the final point, and it comes back to the crux, of there is always a tension around what does growth get you and who's it for? And I think of all of the places that I go to when we talk about that, and we talk about the narrative we have in GM, we know that we have to grow our economy if we're to be a successful city region precisely because of the points around opportunities, around jobs, and with that will mean there is a growing population. That doesn't mean it always has to be done um, as a gentrified approach. And I would say that one of the debates that I have and discussions I have with some um, of my London colleagues, political and otherwise, is that in areas without brownfield sites, you have to knock something down to build something up. But in a place like Manchester and across Greater Manchester, we have so much vacant land, and that's why starting with a brownfield first policy does precisely that. Building new things in places in GM will help solve that. And the final thing I'll say, in the city of Manchester, we've got one of the lowest home ownership rates across all of GM and across all of core cities. Every day I speak to people, they tell me they want the security of owning their own home. So just because we built something that's shared ownership just because we built something that's low cost to go to market doesn't mean that it's an expensive option. So we're building council houses, we're building social homes, we're building shared ownership and we're building um, for low cost sale and it all has to be part of the solution. We're going to build and it's not just going to be gentrification. Um, no, but when you, when you grow a population and you keep um, people from university, you're keeping an income bracket and the city centre, 600 people lived in Manchester city centre at the turn of the last century. That's grown exponentially. And much of our growth will come in places that people don't already live. And that means that we're able to work alongside and make sure that if you're growing up in Ardwick, if you're living in Moss Side, if you're living in Cheatham Hill, actually you've got agency and ownership around some of that to be able to make sure that we're not just a dentikit building, the same things with the same Starbucks and the same corner that has the same offer that are bloody expensive. You need to get a balance within that that works within your communities. Great, thank you very much. Um, Bev, we're going to wrap up there, so can we all thank our speakers, but also thank all of you for coming. <laughs> and I, um, just to plug the free books downstairs and the latest uh, production from the Combined Authority, thank you for the hosting. They, we haven't finished yet. Sorry. Well, wait a second, I was just going to say we need more of these conversations because it's good to join up the national and the local sometimes, and also it's good to have a bit of hope. Have a nice evening, run, go, go, go. <laughs> <laughs>